listen to what I say. <laughs> so please welcome Frances Francesco Cesarini. Thanks, everyone. Um, Joe was well giving an example earlier about middlemen and translating Swedish to English and whatnot. And actually, um, when I decided, you know, I'd, I was hooked on Erlang. Um, I'd come in contact with it in university. I picked up the phone and you know called Joe at Ericsson. And I remember what I said is, "Hi, do you want me to take it in Swedish? Eleskajatade på engelska." which I think kind of follows up, Skyatare po Engelska means you want me to take it in English, but in Swedish. And Joe on the other end just started cracking up and laughing, and that's how we started chatting. And uh, about a week later, I was down for an interview, and I became an intern at the computer science lab, and I've never looked back since. So what I'm going to you know, talk about today is um, how the whole distribution and concurrency model has evolved in the last 15 years. And you know, unlike most other presentations I give, I've not actually written one single slide of these. I've actually taken slides from other people's presentations for this presentation. So you know, the style might be a bit different, and yeah, you might react to it. But yeah, you know, but that's the reason. And not only this is not the first time I'm giving this presentation, and it's not the last time. Uh, the first time I gave it was. March 2009, um, you know, I work for Airline Solutions. Today, you notice you know, the name of the company was at the time Airline Training and Consulting. Uh, first lesson, never name a company after the services you provide, because as soon as you've changed the name, you're going to well add new services. And indeed, about three months after we changed the name, we started providing in-house systems development. Another thing, you know, the, logo, the, the logos changed. We had a graphics design agency who had come to us with this logo, uh, the previous version of this logo, oh no, no, it's not elegant enough, and they redid it to what we see here, and then they came back to us and said, oh no, that's not elegant enough, the, it's not curvy enough, so you know, we gave them lots of money and you know, they gave us this. Um, my title has changed and a lot of things have changed, but you know, what has not changed is the ideas and behind languages and behind learning to think in a particular way. And a lot of people you know, will say to you, oh, Erlang is hard. Well, Erlang is not hard. It's your mental adjustment to actually starting to think in a concurrent way or starting to think differently, which is hard. And how many of you have done C++? Okay. When you were learning C++, didn't they come in and tell you, hey, guess what? You know, you know C, learning C++ is easy. <laughs> Little white lie, but they told you that. And the you know, same with Java. Hey, guess what? You know C++, learning Java is easy. What are the Scala people doing now? Hey, you know Java, learning Scala is easy. <laughs> and, you know, move forward, you know. Um, what are they telling all the Elixir people right now? Hey, all the Rubyists. Hey, guess what? You know Ruby, learning Elixir is easy as well. And, you know, luckily, well, no one came in and told you, oh, learning Erlang is easy. The real hard part here is actually starting to think concurrently and starting to reason concurrently. You know, that's what Erlang actually brought into the picture. And then later on, also distribution. And what I'm going to talk about here in this talk is the history of how, as the concurrency model, as the power of the virtual machine has changed and evolved, the way we think and do things has also changed and evolved. So, you know, the first time I actually gave this talk was 2009. And I'd just recently come back from my first OSCON. It was a few months after OSCON. Uh, and that was OSCON 2008. And one of the keynotes uh, at OSCON was uh, Tim Bray, who's the director of web technologies at Sun Microsystems at the time. And Tim Bray he went in, you know, in front of about 3,000 people and flashed this slide. And it's, uh, it was a picture of Joe on his Royal Enfield. He was very proud. He's just imported it from India at the time. And um, he showed this code right here. Once he'd done it, he goes on, you know, and I started getting all excited. Oh, ooh, you know, Tim's, Tim's mentioning Erlang. And once he'd done it, he went in and said, hey, after you've opened the top of your head, reached in, turn your brain inside out, this starts looking like a natural way to count integers. And if, if you look here, what this does is it just receives... Uh, a message, and if it does, it just increments a counter. And if you request, you know, what you know, the counter, 
you know, the second, um, you know, count two will pass the match and send back a result. Now, this is where I started jumping up and down, saying, oh, hold it here now. And he continues, though, and says, however, you know, having some time playing with this, having spent some time playing with this, I tell you, yeah, if someone came to me and wanted to pay me a lot of money to build a large-scale message handling system that really had to be up all the time, could never afford to go down years on time, I would unhesitatingly choose Erlang to build it in. And, yeah, and, and this is what he was saying. And yeah, ironically enough, um, a few months later, Brian Acton got turned down by Facebook and founded you know, what became WhatsApp. And you know, I was sitting in the audience, and the person sitting next to me goes, oh, yes, you know, the syntax you know, really turns my head inside out. And you know, the person sitting next to me, we know, well, the, the Erlang syntax have never, has never really gone home in the hipster community. Uh, people have kind of gotten stuck on it, curly brackets, semicolons and comma, you know, prologue inspired. Wasn't really, you know, wasn't really, you know, it wasn't really aesthetically nice in their view. But, you know, what Tim was actually talking about is way beyond the syntax. He was looking at the semantics and he was looking at the concurrency model of Erlang. And that's really what he was referring to when, you know, you need to turn your brain inside out. It's that you need to start thinking concurrently. And Erlang was the first language which gave you an incredibly powerful and easy to use concurrent system and concurrency model. And you know, the first time I came across the concurrency model, um, Erlang's concurrency model, was at Uppsala University, where they just basically you know, came in and said, this is the book, read it. These are the exercises, do them. And then off, you know, the lecturer started you know, talking about the horrors of concurrent programming. Deadlocks, semaphores, mutuses, shared state, you know, corrupt memory. He really, really scared us. And we started writing, um, we started working on this um, exercise, which was a simulated world. We had, we had a mixture of you know, carrot patches, which grew in this world, and rabbits running around eating the carrots. And if a rabbit found the carrot, it will tell all the other rabbits, hey, there's a patch here, come eat. And then you had wolves running around hunting the rabbits. And if a rabbit ate a lot or a wolf ate a lot, they'd split in two. If they didn't eat, they'd die of hunger. And the whole goal was to create a simulated world. It was easily done. And what really impressed me and what really got me into Erlang was that once I had everything running and had a nice balanced world, I, I went in in, in my uh, Unix shell and typed PS minus EF and only saw one process running, which was that of the jam. Uh, which was the virtual machine we were using at the time. Despite there being you know, a few hundred wolves and rabbits and you know, carrot patches all growing in the system. And, and th that's really, you know, and it, the, the ease at which we'd got it going w was, was fantastic. And, really, and, and that's what got me into it. And that's what got me thinking, you know, concurrently. Each rabbit was a process, each wolf was a process. And they just communicated with each other and warned each other, you know, through message passing. And that's, you know, that's what... Yeah, that, that's the concurrency model in airline. You know, you've got processes which don't share data, um, it, which don't, don't have shared memory, and they share data through message passing, and they monitor each other for failure. And, you know, and that's the concurrency model, which you know, back in the 90s when we started l l uh, developing large-scale systems, um, forced us to start thinking differently. And the very, very first, I can say, flagship product um, in the airline world was the XD301 switch. Uh, it was developed from scratch in three years, so from nothing to actually shipping to a customer. And in Ericsson years, that's nothing. You know, prior to that, it used to take at least you know, 10 years to think in terms of product, think pro of products and ship them. So three years was, at the time, a record for Ericsson. The XD301 switch you know, consists of about one and a half million lines of airline code and about half a million lines of C++ code. This is the first release, at least. You know, C++ was all device and uh, protocol drivers, UNI signaling stack, and a lot of you know, software, third-party software they'd bought in. And they decided that, well, they designed the whole XD301 switch based on you know, the, the philosophy they had at the time at the computer science lab. And, you know, quoting Mike Williams, you know, first thing he said is you need to design by prototyping. You know, you need, it is not enough to have ideas. You need to make sure they actually work. And finally, make mistakes on a small scale, not in a large scale production project. And this was the first time Erlang was actually being used on a large scale. 
So they started off with a very small core team, and the goal they wanted to achieve, you know, based on you know, what the competition had, was at least 30,000 simultaneous calls per processor pair. And I'm going to explain what a processor pair is. But basically, on two boards, they need to have a, maximum of a minimum of 30,000 calls. And at the time, the virtual machine actually handled about, managed about 30,000 processes. That, that was the limit on the VM at the time. You know, today, we're spoiled. We've got millions of processes, which can run. And I think the memory is the limit on your 64-bit architecture. But back then, it was 30,000. And in the very first proof of concept, you know, to set up a call, uh, just imagine ATM is you know, setting up a connection from one point to another. To set up a call, what they did in the first prototype is had, they had six processes for every call. Each process consisted of a fairly complex finite state machine, and only one of these six finite state machines was active at any one time. So you're following me here, right? Yeah. So that meant that you know, for every call, you had six processes, um, and, you know, and that took you down to 5,000 simultaneous calls, because they were going for a hot standby architecture. That means they had two boards in a processor pair, but one was there for hot standby. So they could only use one of them. So stuck on 5,000 simultaneous calls, they went in and, OK, well, let's start grouping together some of these processes. And they went in and took these finite state machines and basically merged them into two finite state machines, making, you know, giving you a total of 15,000 um, calls per board on one, on one single board which, once again, still wasn't enough. They needed to hit 30,000. Mind you, you know, this was the first time you know, the team working on this prototype had access to such powerful concurrency, such a powerful concurrency model. So they were actually making it up as they went along. Today, I think there are a lot of articles on how to think concurrently and how you should actually model your concurrency based on the power you had. We had none of that back then. And came to the conclusion that, once again, A, you know, two processes per call was... A, the code was really complex, and still we weren't getting enough. You know, we were, weren't getting enough throughput on that particular system. You needed you needed to handle thirty thousand calls. So the next step they did was merge all those finite state machines into one single process. So they had one single process setting up and tearing down all of the calls. So using that approach, all of a sudden. You know, they were able to hit 30,000 calls on a single machine because all you did is you had one process. But that didn't quite work either because, A, the code was completely unmaintainable. It was, you needed old figure uh, to actually figure out how it works. And those of you who you know old figure on the mailing list or have met him in person will know what I'm talking about. So, A, it was completely unmaintainable. B, you had one single process. That meant that you could only set up one call at the time. So they hit a bottleneck. And so the step, you know, the step from there was, OK, now, now that we've got one process, let's try to abstract the code and create temporary processes. You know, let's create two processes per call transaction. So we'll spawn the process when we're setting up the call. Once the call is set up, we terminate those processes and just store the state in an ETS table, in a hash table, or actually in this case it was Mnesia. And when we tear down the call, we spawn again two processes and shut down the call afterwards, and shut them down once the call has been terminated. So from going from a maximum of 5,000 calls, they went down to a maximum of being able to set up 15,000 calls simultaneously. And that's really where the whole thought process about concurrent thinking started taking place. A real concurrent activity in the system is not an ongoing call. A real concurrent activity is actually having, uh, you know, setting up a call and tearing it down. And then from there, and you know, as processes became cheaper, as I mentioned now, you, know, you can have you know, millions of processes you know, they took that code, those two finite state machines, abstracted even more, and you know, for every call transaction, you know, you'll have four to five processes. But this was the whole 
line of thinking, you know, those who were using Erlang when no one else had, you know, to build these types of systems had to go through, you know, to start thinking concurrently. And luckily, you know, this architecture was, you know, they ended up with this architecture as the result of a proof of concept, making sure they knew that their ideas work. And once, you know, they were working and everything was in place, that's when, you know, everyone else, you know, came in. They had about 100 developers on the XD301. But until they knew exactly how they were going to achieve the scalability requirements they were looking for, they did not, you know, get any of these 100 developers to start, you know, implementing any of this critical code. A uh, few words about the distributed um, architecture. This was, at the time, they had an active standby uh, architecture. That means they had two boards uh, connected by a, an ATM backplane. And you were only sending up calls on one of the two boards. So if one of the calls, uh, one, of, one of the boards terminated, the standby one would be on hot standby and it would just go in and take over immediately. And what was happening with the active one is that it got, a, uh, it, it got an instruction to set up a call and it would go down to the device board itself. And when the call was set up, when the connection was set up by the low level, you know, by the protocol drivers, it would signal both to the active and the standby boards that, hey, the call is, has been set up. Which meant that if you lost the active board, all of the calls were duplicated to your standby board. And so the standby board could just take over uh, having an exact copy of the active state. So any calls which were being set up when you know, the active board failed would just be picked up by the, by the standby one. So once again, you know, incredibly well, uh, well thought through architecture, ensuring you know, uh, no single points of failure. And... Yeah, you know, and this is you know this is you know the thinking back in 1997, 1998 when you know the XD 301 finally started shipping. And you know, if we fast forward a few years later, um, this was this was an architecture diagram from the first you know project I worked on outside of Ericsson. And there was a team in Paris working on a um, an XMPP or a Jabber proxy at the time. Um, your standard machines could only handle 512 socket connections per machine. And they wanted to scale uh, an instant messaging solution for a large ISP in France. And the way that, uh, and so what they thought is, okay, but let's get simple commodity hardware where each machine will handle 512 connections, which we then interface towards the actual Jabber servers in the back end. And so I came in and you know, started reviewing their architecture. And what they had is, you know, for every client, they had two processes dealing with the socket. One handling the inbound data, one handling the outbound data. Once they'd received the messages, they'd pass everything on to a process which would decode the message. When the message was decoded, it would pass it on to another process which would handle it. It would do some error handling, you know, check the state. Once that was done, it would pass the message on to another process in the multiplexing, which would encode it and then send it off to the Jabber server. So can anyone know how many messages in parallel could the system handle? Three. Exactly, three. One where you're decoding the message, one when you're handling it, and one when you're encoding it before sending it on. So this team here had come from a C++. This team had a C++ background. They were thinking in terms of threads. They were thinking in terms of serializing the way they do things. And you know, trying to get, and, and, or in terms of pipes, as Joe was saying earlier. But the problem here was that you know, thinking in terms of pipes, they actually you know, weren't using the concurrency model the way they should have. You know, we had a very quick uh, review, and we went in and rewrote a lot of the well, a lot of the concurrency model, we reviewed how they were using concurrency. And, well, what happened here was fairly simple. We had one process which would receive and send messages. And this process would then call a module which would decode the message. Um, once the message was decoded, it would call another module to handle that message. A third module to encode it. And once it was done, it would then send it off to a process which dealt with the socket connection towards the Jabber servers. So, you know, from being able to handle three messages sequentially, you went up to being able to handle about 500 messages. 
or 512, well, depending on you know, all of the sockets. You, know, you could have 512 users connected, or 500, well, depending on the number of Jabber servers, but about 510 uh, connections. So just, just by doing this, you know, they got a 400% increase in throughput, and they went in and did you know, what we're doing today, which is just push all of the bottlenecks down towards the hardware and the underlying operating system. But you know, taking this mental transition, though, they needed to be guided to it. They, they were thinking in terms of C++. This is how we use threads in C++. And, yeah, and basically got stuck by it. Any questions? Any feedback? No? Okay. So yeah, this was the way we did it in 2000. And another project which actually changed the way you know, we, we deal with Erlang today and actually made Erlang really popular was started in 2002. And this process was, th th this project was eJabberD, where they actually went in and took that part right up there, the Jabber servers up there, and started rewriting them in Erlang. The person behind this project was Alexei Sheplin uh, in the Ukraine. And he released it in 2002. And you know, soon after, a, a company called Process One in Paris take it, came on board and started commercially supporting eJabberD. And the, the latest statistics I'm aware of, which is probably seven, eight years old now, is at the time they had about 40% of all of the XMPP instant messaging market. If you look at you know, Facebook and WhatsApp, they all started using eJabberD. And then, you know, improving, refactoring, migrating, they moved away from it. But the first foundation was actually eJabberD. And, you know, back in 2008, uh, eJabberD managed about 30,000, 40,000 users per node on commodity hardware. Um, there's a fork of eJabberD called Mongoose IM, which was made OTP compliant. Um, yeah, and it's being used, you know, for the Internet of Things as well as chats. And on there in this year, we actually managed to hit about one million users on a single node. It was a fairly beefed up machine, but we had a m one million simultaneously connected users. Now, eJabberD does things the way we used to do them back in the mid 2000s. And its whole, you know, its clusters with fully replicated media databases which will work okay-ish if you're running in the same data center, will give you problems as soon as you've got a scale. Um, the way, the way, you know, the way eJabberD works is that for every user logging on, you create a socket connection to a particular node. It, the load balance will route it. Uh, assume you've got three nodes in your cluster. The load balancer will send you a TCP, well, will set up a TCP IP connection, which results in a process being spawned. And this process lives on for as long as your session lives on. And any messages going to and from you go via that particular process. The session data is fully replicated across all the nodes. And it's used by the session manager right here to decide how to route the messages. And to say, when I go in and say, well, this is very much the way we did it in 2002, uh, there, there are two issues with this, with this architecture today. First of all is that each machine will have about one million connected users to it. You lose a whole machine, you don't lose just a million TCP IP connections, you lose a million sessions. And so all of a sudden you're going to get a million users coming back in and hitting and trying to log on on the existing two machines. So that you know, will mean half a million users on each of these two machines. And logging in is a fairly expensive operation. So that, that, that's your first problem you've got right here. The second problem is that of having fully replicated MNESA databases. We know from the CAP theorem that, you know, it's MNESA, well, that among, with consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, you can only use two, choose two of these three at any one time. Amnesia is consistent, it's available, but it's not partition tolerant. So you break a link, a network between, the network goes down in between you know, two of these boards, you need to once again migrate all the users and reconnect them together. So you know, th that's your second problem w w which we're having. And the third thing w with clustering is thinking in terms of a process 
for every truly concurrent activity. When you're dealing with instant messaging, a session is not a truly concurrent activity. Sending a message is a truly concurrent activity. Receiving a message is a truly concurrent activity. A status update is a truly concurrent activity. So what you want to do is actually save your state in a database. And when doing so, um, when doing so, um, you know, retrieve that state when you're dealing with a particular user. And having that state duplicated across all these nodes. So, you know, this is, you know, going from 2002, you know, we took all of that, you know, all of those lessons learned from eJabberD. And mind you, eJabberD and MongoosAM still today are perfect when you're dealing, you know, you still get scalability by federation. You know, so there are a lot of tricks you can do to get the full tolerance and the scalability. Just because it's a 2002 way of doing things doesn't mean <laughs> you shouldn't be using it. And also, you know, there's a huge market for uh, instant messaging servers which do not need to scale to tens of millions of users. So, having said that, you know, we moved from a share everything architecture um, in 2002 to almost a share nothing architecture. And, you know, 2007, 2008, Erlang Solutions got commissioned to do a, uh, an instant messaging gateway where you'd connect smartphones you know, to a set, to a cluster. And what this gateway would do is it would control access to um, you know, chat and mail systems such as you know, Windows Live, so Hotmail, and MSN Instant Messaging, which just recently got shut down, ICQ, AIM, you know, Google Talk, Gmail, and so on. And you know, taking the lessons we had learned from you know, from, um, from EJABRD, we split everything up into two levels. We split architecture up into two levels. On the top level, we would have what we call the front-end nodes. And the only thing they would do was handle TCP IP connections and parsing of data. So they'd be completely stateless. An HTTP, a, a request you know, to send an email or receive an instant message would come in. It would be received by the router, it would keep the socket connection alive, it would parse the message. Once it had parsed it, it would then do um, a consistent hashing to one of the three backend nodes. The three backend nodes, upon receiving this message, it could be you know, send an IM, receive an IM, it could be um, you know, status update, login or logout request. Upon receiving it, it would spawn a new process. And this process was alive for as long as that message was being managed. And using Nesia across these three uh, machines allowed us to decide very easily what data we would be sharing or not sharing. So with very, very little overheads, we could go in and you know, switch the off around the Nesia configurations to have a share nothing, share something, and share everything architecture. And the share nothing meant that, you know, these three, three kind of backend machines wouldn't share any of the session data or any of the messages. Share something, what we did do was allow just the sharing of the session data. And share everything, we'd share not only all of the session data, but all of the messages being sent and received across all of the nodes. And you know, to give you some statistics, I mean, we had to handle, this system had to handle um, contractually 15,000 um, messages or requests per second. Every request was about four HTTP requests. It was about seven destructive database operations. It was about seven log entries and, you know, plus all the business logic associated with it. So it wasn't just a simple request. There was, there was more to it than just you know, sending a request or receiving a reply. And, you know, 15,000, um, and it was done on a really cheap um, Dell cluster. I think at the time we paid maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for that Dell cluster. And, you know, with no single point of failure. So that meant that, you know, when we were pushing 15,000 requests through, you know, we could go in and kill this machine or kill any of the machines or pull out network cables. The system still had to run at full capacity. And you know, we started stress testing the, the various 
uh, approaches. And if we were sharing absolutely everything, so if we're sharing messages, we were sharing state and requests, we were handling about 3,000 messages per second. The biggest challenge, the biggest problem we were having was the data duplication and networking in I.O. We shut down all of the duplication so that we weren't sharing any data and we, we managed about 16,000 requests per second without any issues. We should, turned on the sharing just of the session data and that gave us you know, about 15,000 requests per second. No, all of these machines were running about 30-40% CPU just to ensure that there'd be also redundant computing power for it. And we stopped at, well, we, we, so we ended up sharing just the session data because what that meant is that if we lost one of these backend machines, the routers up front would then just re-forward the requests on to the other nodes. The session data would be there, they'd be easily handled without any issues. Yeah. Is that okay? Does that make sense? Cool, okay. So, you know, and, and this is you know, the way we started doing it in 2007. So this is more or less at the time when the Dynamo paper was written. But you know, we didn't need, you know, we were in Europe back then, we didn't have the scalability requirements Amazon, uh, Yahoo, eBay, and PayPal were having. And so th that's how we were thinking and reasoning. And I think what was worth saying here in this, w w when uh, we're working on this system is you know, around 2007, 2008, that's when you seriously started developing on multi-core architectures. And that's really, you know, the lessons, apart from the architecture, you know, the way we were thinking and reasoning, that's when multi-core hit us for the first time. And what was happening, you know, prior to multi-core, you'd go in, you'd have your little Erlang node, you'd start stress testing it, it would hit 100% CPU, after which you'd start seeing a slight degradation in performance. Um, what we're seeing here is the throughput per second of your system versus the number of simultaneous requests. So imagine that you know, here we had 100 simultaneous requests going through your system, and your throughput was 100 messages per second. What you, know, you should be seeing in a properly um, optimized system is, you know, if you go from 100 requests per second to 200 requests per second, your throughput should remain the same. So the only thing which would change is latency. And so all of a sudden, from going, you know, handling a, a request in a second, your request should be down, you know, it should take two seconds to handle the request, but you're still handling in your system 100 requests per second. And that's really, you know, having a system which behave, pre behaves in a predictable way with no degradation of service under heavy load. And, and that's one of the things Erlang gives you. And you needed a bit of optimizing and fine-tuning to get there. But, you know, you ran at 100% CPU, and right up there you went in, you figured out what your bottlenecks are. Often, you, know, you could just see a process message queue getting longer and longer. You went in and you fixed that, um, either by, you know, changing asynchronous calls to synchronous calls or by removing a lot of the workload in that particular process. And... So in this particular project, we just set aside two weeks for stress testing and optimizing because it was, you know, if you knew what you were doing, it was a fairly easy task. And you know, if you look at this slide, th those of you who know this slide will notice the, similar, the similarities. Irrespective of, you know, this is um, measuring yours. It's, you know, Joe, Joe's, uh, I think it's from your thesis, Joe, right? No? Okay. So it's another study you did, but um, what it is, if you've got 80,000 simultaneous requests, irrespective of if you've got 50,000, 10,000, or 80,000, your throughput in kilobytes per second will be the same, and it's the yours web server right here. And, and this, is, you know, this is exactly what we're seeing here. And this is what we're expecting. So we start stress testing, um, and we get two load machines, and we've got a few eJabberD clusters in the back end receiving all of the um, pain. And we start loading everything as fast as possible. The first thing which happens is the firewall crashes. The firewall couldn't handle the load. So we shut down the firewall. Next thing which happens is we need to put in more backend machines because we're generating too much load. And the eJabberD cluster in the backend couldn't handle that load. So we do that. We then get the Alton load balancers to crash because, once again, they couldn't handle the load. And we went from the load machine straight to... Uh, the cluster, we got given, uh, you know, we had to you know, find a few more load machines. Um, 
we did try Amazon, it was a nightmare. It wasn't just, you know, you were restricted on I.O. So we were running everything in our own data center. We had to find even more load machines. And in the end, ended up replacing Altium with F5 load balancers, which at the time were the best ones you could get. They were really expensive. They just they lent them to us. And once again, even there, we got the F5 load balancers to crash <laughs> because we were pushing it so hard. And finally, when we started generating any serious load on MMGS, you know, that's really where nightmares started coming up, showing up. Because all of a sudden, you know, um, we were running on multi-core architectures. And you know, three months on, we were still chasing issues which we had never seen before. We were, we were calling Ericsson, not even Ericsson had seen them before. And you know, we were coming across you know, IO starvation, you know, TCP IP congestion. We were getting memory spikes, which um, you know, happened all the time, but on a single core, they were very deterministic. On quad core or you know, machines, all of a sudden you get, you're getting spikes, and the you know, more cores you added, the more the chances that all of these memory spikes pulled together to create a monster spike, forcing your VM to run out of memory were happening. We'd never seen any of this before, and you know, we started having to deal with uh, airline runtime system configuration flags, OS limitations. We had to shut down the audit logs uh, and so on. And yeah, th these were the lessons, you know, which basically came about with, you know, dealing with multi-core. You know, stress test your systems and, you know, your airline VM will probably be so powerful, your issues, you know, will be in the underlying operating system, in your networking. And, you know, I issues which, you know, before you never had to deal with, all of a sudden in 2008, you know, started becoming a fact. And, you know, we were, you know, instead of two weeks stress testing, it ended up taking us three months to get the system stable and you know doubling the people we had we ended up putting on it so um you know moving on your know, two multicore you know what is it we need to think about the concurrency model now when we're dealing with multicore architectures and you know, this is a presentation a company called concurrix gave at the airline factory a couple of years ago where they went in and picked uh, chicago boss which i think we're going to have a presentation of about a little bit later and they started running it. They, they took a Ruby on Rails uh, application, the new of, which was handling out of the box about 30 uh, requests per second. They went in and took, rewrote this application in Erlang and started running on a machine with two cores. They got about 40 requests per second. They increased the number of cores to four. They still got 40 requests per second. All the way up to 64 cores, they were still getting 40 requests per second. And what we don't think about today when dealing with multiple, what we need to think about is your bottlenecks. Um, they went in and started investigating. They actually went in and built tools to figure out why you know, performance was, was being hit so badly. And quickly went in and found that you've got a lot of workers which were serializing all of the output, all of the requests via gen server. And they were hitting the gen server and that meant that you could basically handle one request at a time. And you know, what you're seeing here are the effects of Amdahl's law, which tells you that your program will be as fast as your slowest component. And in this case, the slowest component is the sequential code. So you know, when you want your programs to scale on multi-core architectures, you need to start thinking in terms of concurrency and thinking in terms of your sequential code, minimizing it and you know, trying to push as much of that computation over. And indeed, you know, they got rid of that gen server, and immediately on two cores, you know, they hit about 400 requests. On, on four cores, they scaled up to 500. And up to eight cores, you know, they were way past 1,000 requests. And at about 1,000 requests, guess what? They hit their next bottleneck. So you know, there's still lots of headroom for improvement, but you start getting, you know, once you get rid of your bottlenecks, you start getting your linear scalability. A um, few more words, I think, uh, you know, future architectures, um, you know, we're now thinking distributed. So this is, you know, the, 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 um, this is, well, the ring stolen from one of Basho's presentations. If you don't see this ring in a Basho presentation, the speaker is probably not being paid. I don't know if you've got your ring, Steve. You've got it, perfect, exactly. So St Steve will tell us more about it, but I think um, the Dynamo paper from Amazon comes into the picture here on how you then start distributing 
your system using, uh, using, uh, using consistent hashing across a cluster of machines. And I think that's, we're seeing more and more architectures going this route. Another uh, approach is SD Erlang. They've taken the concept of process groups and then applied them to distributed Erlang, where you basically start creating clusters of nodes which interact with each other via gateways. And I think you know, we're seeing more and more of these architectures as well, where you, know, you start sharing data via particular gateways. And finally, also, I think something which is a bit in the, is, is in the future, but not that far off, is Erlang on Zen, and looking at the Link virtual machine, where you know, if you think of multi-core, you will see machines with a million cores within our lifetime, and how do you actually program and use, utilize these cores? The answer is, hey, you know, try to get your VM to scale to as many cores as possible, but you will hit your limits. So the next thing is distribution. Distribution and multi-core go hand in hand, very much hand in hand. And I think that's where you know, Erlang on Zen and Ling together, the Ling virtual machine, where you know, you're able to fire off an Erlang VM in a few milliseconds, are going to really take, start, start taking off soon. And once again, we'll need a completely different mind shift as to how we deal with it, because you'll be firing off Erlang machines and taking them down in milliseconds, you know, based on specific needs and requirements, which is a different way of how we deal with it. And also incredibly interesting, and I think Stu Bailey had a keynote about it at the Erlang user conference this year, is the integration of a software-defined networking switch, the link switch, in the, the link virtual machine, which basically allows you to set up and tear down connections among these VMs um, in milliseconds and then optimize you know, based on your bandwidth for latency. And I think you know, that, that's literally where I think you know, we'll be thinking in a few years' time. You know, today, you know, we're trying to think, you know, what cool things can we do with this? And the only things we can think of is you know, big data analytics, where you just have a lot of data you need to move. You need to optimize the network on how you move this data. You need to fire off instances which crunch it and, yeah, and then send back a response. So almost the next generation of MapReduce. But you know, the problems we're solving you know, have been changing, have been evolving. And I think, you know, I'm sure we've got a really good solution on how to deal with massive distributed systems on machines with millions of cores. I'm sure we'll find a solution, you know, for, for that as well and a good use case for it. Right. I think I'm out of time, but if you have any questions, I am around. Um, yeah, so go ahead. Let's take one and then we'll do this one. Yeah. How do you see Docker playing into some of these new concepts? I mean, Docker is a way of deploying and managing system so i think docker is an interesting uh, is really interesting i think it's still early days to say exactly how it's going to impact everything but when i'm talking about erlang on zen and firing off a lot of these instances i think the concepts are, you know, are very similar so i think you know, the, the the line of thought is, is 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 the correct one yeah okay well is the break now all right okay thank you very much